Welcome. I'm Steve Tackett of Grace Bible Network. We are very pleased to welcome you to this video class. We are proud of the quality of Grace Bible Network's online Bible studies and recordings available on both our website and YouTube. Whether you watch them online or just listen to the audio portion on your commute to work, we are glad you're here. Please enjoy the recording. Okay, welcome to the Monday Night Bible Study. And our subject for tonight is going to be, Does God Chastise Believers Today? So let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we have your word that we can uh, go to at any time. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you made your complete word accessible to us and uh, we can understand everything you want us to understand from it. We thank you that it's complete and uh, it's uh, the authority that you've given us. Uh, we know that in your word, it says that you put your word, you have magnified your word above your own name. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you provided that for us so that we can understand your mind, your will, your purpose, your character, and everything about you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, we're not at a loss. We don't have to search uh, any place out any place else but your word to find all the truths you want us to know. And so as we come to your word tonight, we pray that we would come to that understanding that you would have us to have. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The subject for tonight is, does God chastise believers today? Well, the first thing I want you to look at, if you would, is Hebrews chapter 12. I want you to look with me at verse 5. Now, this passage of scripture is commonly used to say that, yes, the Lord chastises us today. Um, so let's just read these verses and then we'll talk about it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, where are all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not, uh, excuse me, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastised us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Okay. First thing I want to point out to you is that who is this letter written to? Well, all you have to do is go back to the beginning of the letter. And it says, the epistle to the Hebrews. Now, we are not Hebrews. We're not replacement Hebrews. We're not spiritual Hebrews or spiritual Israel. We're not replacement Israel. This letter is written specifically to the Hebrews. And what is the context? The context is 
Again, it's written to Hebrews, and it's written to explain the role of Christ's sacrifice on the cross for the nation Israel in the context of prophecy and explains what they need to do, what they need to believe, the doctrines that they need to have faith in during the time that is called the tribulation. In fact, we usually refer to all the letters from Hebrews to Revelation as tribulation letters because they're primarily about the tribulation. Now, that's the context, that's the, and that's the dispensational context. But does that mean that we don't need to apply or should we apply anything in the book of Hebrews to ourselves? Well, I think we'll find out when we read Paul's letters, and of course, Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles, we'll find out that, yes, the Lord still chastens us. And so chastening is something that is really uh, trans-dispensational. But there's something else I want you to notice. Turn with me to um, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter eight. Chastening is is for today, but the context is very important to understand when we're talking about the subject of chastening. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and let's look at verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. So, there in the letter of Deuteronomy, the uh, second letter of the law given to Israel, we see that God chastens his sons. And the context is about whether or not you're going to keep the law of Moses. Look with me to... Um, Look with me to Deuteronomy. This time, let's look at uh, chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And when you get there, let's begin at verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hast hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. You see, the chastening in the Old Testament is receiving the curse because you didn't obey God's commandments. You see, the law is a system of blessing and cursing. It's a conditional covenant God made with Israel. If you obey the commandments of God, then you got the blessing. And if you did not, you got the curse. And it was always in, the ter in terms of the physical blessings. Uh, one thing I left out of uh, this passage or this this point here, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8 real quick, I was going to read more of that passage to show you that the blessings and the cursings that he's talking about are physical. Back in Deuteronomy 8 verse 7, it says, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains, and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. So the blessings 
in the Old Covenant were physical, and the curses were physical. It was a physical curse that you received. And what many Christians today do is they think that because they got a flat tire or they caught the cold or they got fired from their job, that God was chasing them. God was punishing them for some act of disobedience. Well, that kind of thinking is under the law. That kind of thinking is thinking based upon the law principle that we just read about in the Old Testament. And that is not how God deals with us today. Now, he does chasten us, but he doesn't chasten us through the circumstances. You know, you have something bad happen to you, and you ask yourself the question, what is God trying to tell me? Well, he doesn't talk to you. He doesn't communicate with us. He doesn't uh, guide us and direct us through circumstances. God is not trying to tell you anything. God has already told you everything that you need to know in his word. Um, but let's look at some other verses here. Look at... Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Romans chapter 7, verse 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. If you remember the body of Christ, and you are, if you believe the gospel, then you're dead to the law. The law has no place as far in your life as far as your relationship with God. God does not deal with you and me today according to the law. He does not deal with you on the basis of cursings and blessings. You are dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve a newness of the spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. So no, your flat tire, or your catching the cold, or losing your job have nothing to do with God chastising you, God punishing you. And by the way, chastisement is not punishment. Chastisement is correction. To be chastised is to be corrected. Those two things are synonymous with one another. So if God is chastising you, what he's doing is he's correcting you. And he's not doing it through flat tires. Turn with me to, um, we're in Romans. Look at Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You see, all the world is guilty before God based upon the law. The only purpose that the law has today is to show us that we are a sinner, to show us we need a savior we that we cannot say of ourselves we can never live up to god's standards no nobody can live up to god's standards only one person walked that ever walked the face of the earth lived up to god's standards and that was god in the flesh so all the world 
is guilty before God. And let me say one other thing about that. Look at James. The book of James. And chapter 2 and verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Guilty of all. So all you have to do is disobey one point of the law. And what does God's word say? Well, you're guilty. You're still guilty. Nobody has the ability to keep all 600 and some odd laws. And if you break just one, you're guilty of all. Now, I'm getting violent here. Okay. Um, look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. You've got to understand... Romans chapter 10, verse 1. You've got to understand that the law has no place in your relationship with God today other than to show you that you're a sinner. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And you know that describes most Christians today. They have a zeal but they don't have the knowledge. What good is zeal without the knowledge? For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So I just wanted to hammer home that point. Okay, you are not under the law. God is not dealing with you according to the law. Your relationship with God has absolutely nothing to do with the law. The only thing the law can do is show you that you need a savior. Now, um, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. As I pointed out, Chastisement simply means to be corrected. And so how does God correct us? 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what is one of the purposes of the scripture? To correct us. So yes, we are chastised today because we are corrected if we receive the correction correctly. We are corrected by the word of God. We are chastised by the word of God because chastising and correction are the same thing. So number one, God chastises the believer today through the word of God, through what the scriptures teach. When you read the scriptures, you meditate upon them and you see what is right and what is wrong, God corrects you. He corrects you through his word. And that's the chastisement that you receive from God. Now, that's not the only way that you're, you're chastised, but look with me to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2.
and look at verse 13. Paul says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The point is this. Have you received the word of God as the word of God? Have you allowed it to effectually work in you? Uh, because if you believe it, it will work effectually in you. If you reject it, then it won't. And you will not receive the correction that you need. You see, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our mind needs to be renewed. The mind that we came into this world with was a, a blank slate. But as we got older, we were influenced by the course of this world and our minds were basically controlled by the course of this world. So our minds need to be transformed. Romans chapter 12 says in verse one, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, that's the only way you can, you can not be conformed to this world is to have your mind transformed. And the only way it's going to be transformed is through, again, the word of God. We need to have a way we think changed. And the only way it can be changed is through faith in his word. Um, turn with me now to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. This is the other way that God chastens us today is through other believers. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You see, part of restoration is to show you where you went astray. And that can be done through someone who is spiritual. In other words, someone who understands they need to follow Paul's instructions. Someone who's mature in the faith to get you help get you back to a place of restoration. And that's going to require being corrected by the word of God. So that's another way that God chastens us. He uses other believers to chasten us. And there is also another way. If you stay in Galatians chapter 6, it says in verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So the point is here is that there are still consequences to sin. Yes, Christ took the punishment and the wrath of God upon himself on the cross. He took our sins upon himself at the cross. He paid the price on that cross so that we will never have to face the wrath of God. We'll never have to be uh, 
and will never have to pay for our sins in any way, shape, or form. We don't pay for our sins in eternity. But are there consequences to sin today? Yes, there are. There's still consequences. If you rob a bank, it doesn't matter if you're saved or not. You're still going to suffer the consequences. If you smoke cigarettes, your health isn't going to be good. See, there's always consequences to wrong behavior. Always consequences. You can't escape that. And I believe it's safe to say that when you go to the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne judgment, of course, but the judgment seat of Christ, which is just for saved people, that you could lose rewards because of your behavior down here on earth. That could be, you could face shame and condemnation when you get to heaven. You won't lose your salvation, but you can be shamed. God's going to point some things out to you. You're going to lose some rewards. So there are always consequences to bad behavior. And that's the other way that God can chase, can chase us. Sometimes we, knowing something is wrong, we go ahead and do that thing anyway. We know, we know that thing is wrong. We do it anyway. And then another believer finds out about it, what you did, and they confront you on it. That's chastisement. Because then you have to face the fact what you did was wrong. And there's shame and there's guilt. And hopefully then you repent. So there's ways that God does ch chastise us today. He does correct us. He first of all corrects us with his word. And if the word, if we're not corrected by his word, if we reject what the word says, then he may use another believer to help you get corrected, get, you know, and you experience the chastisement of your bad behavior. You bet you get chastised when you suffer the consequences of your bad behavior. So that's how God chastises us today. But I want to uh, point out a couple other things in that regard. Um, look at Romans chapter 13. There is something else. And I actually kind of briefly mentioned it when I talked about robbing a bank. Um, just because you're saved doesn't mean you can get do whatever you want to. You're not going to get away with it. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive damnation to themselves. Excuse me, I want to say it correctly shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, that's not damnation to hell. The damnation is suffering the consequences of your illegal activities. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. So in that sense, you could experience the wrath of God from human government because you robbed the bank. So you can't escape that. You just can't escape that. And the whole point of Romans chapter 3 is the, how important it is for us to be, as believers in Christ, good citizens, setting a good example. Now, let's look at another passage. Look at, while we're in Romans, look at Romans 8. 
Romans 8. Please don't think that because things aren't going so hot that God is mad at you. Again, let me, let me emphasize that by showing you these passages in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? See, you could experience all those things. Those things could become a reality in your life. And it doesn't mean God stopped loving you or God's mad at you. No, those are things that can happen just as a result of living in this sin-cursed world where the majority of people on this planet do the bidding of Satan. It's just part of living in this world. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So those things don't separate us from the love of God. We haven't been separated. People have an expression today. How did I end up in this God forsaken place? Excuse me? If you're a believer, you're not forsaken by God. Your circumstances may be horrible, but God hasn't forsaken you. No. You got an enemy who wants to destroy you. Yeah. You got an enemy that wants to make things difficult for you. To make you give up. But God hasn't forsaken you. He's always with you. You just may have to go through some very bad things. Um, let me just share, share with you uh, another verse regarding the 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 um, the fact that all men, all of mankind has a conscience, no matter what the culture is, uh, no matter what the beliefs are, every culture on this planet knows there's a right and a wrong because there are people. People inherently have an understanding of what is of right and wrong. Look at Romans again. Look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law... So remember, the law was never given to Gentiles. But notice what it says. Which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are law unto themselves. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness. And their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. See, Lost people and say people have a conscience, conscience, and it shows the work of the law in their hearts. Um, look at Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. In Acts chapter 28, look at verse 1. And when they were escaped, that they knew that the island, island was called Melita, and the barbarous people. Now, barbarous people are people who are unrefined, uncivilized, uneducated. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire 
and received us everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when they should have, when it should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm came to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God. Now, of course, they're showing their ignorance, but what else are they also showing? They're showing they have a conscience. They have a conscience. They assume that because uh, this snake had bitten Paul, that he must have been guilty of murder or something. There is a witness there, the witness of accountability to God. There's a sense of justice in that culture because there's a witness inside of every man lost or saved of right and wrong and so they just assume god was getting vengeance on paul so paul had to show them the truth so it's natural to think that if something bad happens to you, somehow the universe is getting back at you. But that's not the case at all. Bad things happen. Now, sometimes bad things happen because of our choices, but sometimes they happen. And it's not because of our choices, it's because of somebody else's choice. But God is not punishing you. If you're a member of the body of Christ, you are, Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, complete in him. And you cannot be separated from the love of God, Romans chapter 8. So I hope you uh, appreciated this message uh, tonight, and I hope that was helpful to you. And so we'll go ahead and close, and we'll see you next time. Hello again. Hope you enjoyed the recording. If you liked it, would you please help us with our YouTube ratings? Would you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel? You can unsubscribe anytime you like. It helps us reach more people with the teaching of the word rightly divided. For more information on our online Bible classes, please check our website at www.gracebiblenetwork.org. We are a nonprofit entity supported by our ministry partners, and we will never solicit donations. This is God's ministry, and he always provides for our needs. Remember that God's grace is a gift itself, freely given us through his son. His grace is sufficient to save you from all your sins. But only if you have faith in what Christ has already completed for you on your behalf. He died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for our justification. Thank you very much.